Hello, and I welcome you all, all our subscribers and panelists for this subscriber exclusive initiative of the Print Charcha. This is our monthly initiative where we discuss important issues. So thank you all for joining us. As you all know, today we are discussing an important issue, which is uh, the water crisis in cities. And uh, today we have an eminent panel of experts to discuss this issue. We are today joined by Anshuman. He is the Director of Water Resources at the Energy Resources Institute, Terry. And we are joined by Sahana Goswami. She is a Senior Program Manager of Water Resilience at the World Resources Institute, India. Thank you so much for joining, Sohana and Anshuman. Thank you. And before Good I start... Be thank you. Before I start this discussion, I want to thank all our subscribers for um, the support that they have shown us. It is only because of you all that we are able to host events like these and also take up important uh, ground reports. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so before I start, so just to start this discussion, Sahana, I want you to talk a little bit about and tell us uh, what is it that uh, cities are facing this serious water crisis today? What are the reasons? What are the key factors? Uh, climate change is one, but unplanned urbanization, you know, do you think that has led to it? Thanks, Risha, for having me uh, as part of this uh, discussion. And thank you for framing uh, the question in that manner, because uh, I think a lot of uh, concern uh, and uh, looking at this sort of water crisis um one of the key reasons that we would uh, consider is that uh, particularly for this year that we are seeing and the reports that are coming out is that the water crisis is really not just about water supply but it's really about the diminishing of our aquifers and our groundwater that is there mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of complex reasons for that and yes truly organization and, uh, but that's a bit of focus I want to just give a bit of a broader context uh, to people who are listening in uh, is that to understand that in India the uh, share that we have of water for say urban or domestic use is about 10 to 12 percent uh, of the total water share about 80 percent of our water is actually used for agriculture what is being extracted and used across uh, and that is uh, sort of true in uh, all sorts of sources of water that that we uh, look at, whether it's surface water, groundwater, and so on. So just to keep that in context, that while we are facing this very severe crisis across multiple cities, uh, this year particularly, it's been in large cities like Delhi and Bangalore, so it's really in the news. But uh, for many years, for decades, in fact, uh, it has been something that's happened in, say, smaller towns of Nashik, Sholapur, Nagpur, etc. And we always have heard of these stories of, you know, water trains and so on going on. Uh, so there are complex issues, but the urban context is, is limited. Uh, it's not uh, something to say that India is running out of water in that manner. Urban India can manage, but really the practices that are in place and the way we look at water uh, and try and understand it is really a bit flawed so far. So I think that's really one of the things that we really need to think about. Uh, and in terms of urbanization, the biggest challenge is that that's this huge concentration of demand that's happening. A lot of people who require water uh, and of course, water utilities are trying to reach and provide water su supply to all households. There's a lot of national schemes, state schemes that are there in place for such uh, uh, activities, uh, but it takes time. So that's that's sort of just the process that is required when you're doing infrastructure. Uh, and until that happens, because cities are already filled with people, they start depending on groundwater. And what we are seeing this year really is that uh, the combination of the extreme heat, the requirement for more water, uh, and uh, the fact that we have been uh, withdrawing really uh, in a very unsustainable manner has really reached the brink. So I think that is one of the key factors we should think of when we think of water crisis, uh, particularly for this year. Yeah. And uh, groundwater, you know, it's depleting and we are not doing much to recharge the groundwater. Right. So and illegal construction we are seeing in several cities, Bengaluru, in Delhi also we see that water bodies, there is massive construction encroachment on water bodies. So Anshuman, I would like to bring you in that, what do you think, are civic agencies doing enough to protect our water bodies? 
Well, if you uh, would like to take a look at our performance as far as urban supply and urban water management is concerned, and since you mm -hmm. mentioned about water body itself, hmm. I think uh, review by the ministry itself last year uh, kind of told us that almost of the kind of you know, surface water bodies which are there in Delhi, um, around 73%, 72% is basically not being managed well. They are either dry, they are, you know, uh, dumped with all kind of solid waste, even liquid waste. So they are almost uh, uh, non-functional. And uh, as you said, they are also severely affected by encroachment. So the kind of urban planning that we have had and we have left away the usual known old practice of, you know, water harvesting, Hmm. Um, you know, by our traditional methods, as well as, you know, what is even now being talked about through rainwater harvesting, we have not really followed that. And yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why we have not been able to look at the, you know, augmentation of the existing sources, which anyways have been encroached and depleted. That's one. But the problem is also compounded by how we have used the water, managed the water. I mean, India is still blessed, I would say, to have, you know, a good rainfall and a good amount of water available to us. The problem is not really the I mean, it is availability in some locations, but in many locations is the misuse of water. If you look mm. into the kind of you know, water available to not only Delhi, most of the you know, major cities and class one, two and class two cities as well. I mean, uh, so anywhere between 30 to 50 percent is what we are losing after treatment, after procurement from a source, investing mm. into treatment and supply systems and then wasting almost 30 to 50 percent of that water. As of now, as you speak, the Delhi, you know, or you know, kind of figures would tell you anywhere between 50% yes. is what is being lost from the system. So mm -hmm. how we are using is much of the you know, uh, reason why we are facing this scarcity. Yes, mm -hmm. there are natural reasons. For example, yeah. there would be, you know, a scarcity of rainfall and some, some period. Of course, climate change induced impacts are as well aggravating the situation. So there are uh, natural reasons for why we are seeing the, you know, uh, kind of challenges. Uh, Bangalore faced that as well. But... I mean, I would say as far as the, you know, uh, uh, the, the management that we are talking about, it's largely how we are managing the water resources is what is responsible for it. We are not even metering. I will come to that in yeah, a bit later in detail, but we are not even metering that, you know, properly. Yeah. Uh, the water that's been, you know, kind of discharged is largely a very small fraction, which is looked upon as reuse recycle. Mm -hmm. I mean, and all of these are the kind of, you know, to augment the water resources and ensure water security, but we have not done well on that. Yeah. So just to build on and the point Anshuman said, you know, the recent uh, report, um, Delhi Economic Survey report 2023-24 mentions that uh, the water loss during distribution is around 58% in Delhi, which I think is huge. So uh, I would like both of you to talk a little bit about it, that this non-revenue water, what is the reason for uh, cities uh, where water, water is lost during distribution? And how can cities plug this problem? So, uh, Anshuman, would you like to go first? And Sahana, sure. maybe uh, you can see, take it up later. What needs to be done? Just for the audience to understand, uh, non-revenue yeah. water is a technical term, yeah. largely for the amount of water which is lost from the system as leakage losses, or even uh, for those kind of water which we have not been able to account for. Uh, and earn the revenue for. So which includes, for example, those which are pilferages, uh, those which also are because of the meter inaccuracies, or we have not been able to bill, or even if we haven't able to bill, we have not been able to collect. So all that accounts for, you know, uh, water for which we have not been for some reasons able to generate the revenue. Now, mm -hmm. ideally, mm -hmm. um, most of the percentage of water and as far as the service level benchmarks, uh, mm -hmm. the non-revenue water should be less than 20% or less than 50%. But okay. we are very, very high. As you said, we are around 50% in the national capital of Delhi uh, as of now. Now, the reasons are various. You know, as I said, one, we are not metering, you know, as to how much water is reaching. Uh, our systems are not really uh, efficient enough to supply water. And we, as I said earlier, we have significantly huge amount of leakage losses into the system. Um, one of the reasons why we are actually losing out significant water. And as I said earlier, this mm -hmm. is that water which we invest and, and invest into the infrastructure to bring it from some source yeah. and treat them at a cost. And then, you know, invest into a supply distribution system, including pipelines and the reservoirs. Uh, and after that, we lose 50% of that water. So it's a crime almost, you know, it's very, very criminal kind of negligence as far as water management is concerned. Hmm. So the reason I think is largely to look into how we are not able to plug our leakages. Hmm. Uh, I would also want to mention, it's not just the you know urban local bodies which are responsible. We as a citizen as well are responsible. 
Now, there are two problems why we are again seeing a lot of wastage. One, we as citizens have not valued water. And the reason has been that that value of water has not been instilled by the, you know, agencies, you know, for us to. Now, water is not free of cost. Uh, it comes at a supply cost. Uh, consumers have had never a feeling that this is a valuable resource and is, you know, supplied to you after some kind of investment and management uh, in investment. Now, if we are not giving the right value of water, not right pricing of water to the consumers, obviously consumer will, you know, tend to waste it. Take a case of electricity, take a case of, you know, petrol. Why don't we waste one, one drop of uh, petrol, for example? We don't have pinch of, you know, water pinch. For example, it doesn't pinch our pocket to waste the water. And that's the reason why we are wasting. So consumers as well are responsible for it. But then as a management, uh, as ULBs, I think we are also failing to see that the rational pricing of water is not there. And hmm. therefore, a lot of wastages and leakage losses tend to be, you know, happening at the consumer end. Hmm. So I think these are the key reasons why we continue to see these kind of, you know, uh, losses and therefore the non-revenue water to be in a very high percentage. Uh, not only Delhi, by the way, in many cities hmm. across the country. Okay. So here I would like to take a question from one of our subscriber. We'll come to the pricing issue uh, a little, little later. But one of our subscribers, Iqbal Malik, has a, a question for uh, our panelists. Basically, he wants to know that what Anshuman just mentioned, basically, he, that's exactly what he wants to know, that why authorities don't impose hefty fines on water wastage, you know, to prevent that, why are we, you know, people are using, washing their cars, they're cleaning their courtyards. So why are uh, civic authorities not imposing hefty fines? And do you think that now is the time we should do this? Uh, Sahana, would you like to... Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Risha, for uh, putting that question across. Uh, I think uh, fines and penalties have a space within the institutional framework. Mm -hmm. uh, but to do it in this situation of crisis, I think, would be a bit knee-jerk. Particularly, okay. again, picking up on what everyone was saying, mm -hmm. that we do not, as a civic society, have this training or understanding on how to deal mm -hmm. with water. Mm -hmm. Really look at it. Uh, as this free resource that's available, we do not have the understanding of where it's coming from, the effort and the cost that goes into it. So to say that we will find people without people having an understanding of why this is being put in would be a bit problematic because uh, there are going to be a lot of issues around it. And particularly when we look at uh, a lot of uh, section of society who are not so well off, uh, who may end up having to uh, bear a larger proportion of uh, or burden of uh, this because on how policies like universal policies that get designed sort of have uh, more negative impacts or more disproportionate impacts on uh, low income households and so on. So we have to be a bit cautious when we put this in. I think the starting point really has to be with awareness and communications. And uh, I, I think South Africa, Cape Town, which has been in the news uh, a few years ago with its whole A0 situation, really tried and build, built that up. Like they had public displays of information on where the reservoirs were, uh, that and it really made a whole civic movement that everyone was responsible for saving water for being uh, water conscious and so on and unless we do that uh, and without having done that we say that we will find people for wasting water that's a bit premature yes there has to be uh, methods to sort of stop this uh, indiscriminate use particularly during stress periods but just a finding system without this education and information to consumers or citizens is a bit problematic uh, so yeah so that's one uh, a key reflection that I would have. Okay. And, but um, when you say awareness campaign, so how can we, like a lot of our subscribers had asked us that, you know, uh, can corporates come forward? There, can there be initiatives taken uh, where people can participate? You know, like one of our subscriber, uh, Hannah Abraham asked uh, that, you know, how can communities contribute, you know, in uh, basically rejuvenating our water bodies because uh, it's very difficult for them to actually start an initiative on their own but if there is an initiative taken by say a big corporate or a government organization or an ngo it is easier for them to join in you know and everybody doesn't have the knowledge uh, how to go about things what exactly needs to be done so what is your what are your thoughts on that should government plan um, some campaign like we have the swachh bharat mission which got a good response from people uh, and has brought about a change, uh, you know, and I mean, people can disagree or uh, can have uh, their own opinion about the success of the campaign, but definitely it has changed our perception. It has changed how people, our attitude towards uh, the thing. So what, are, what do you think? Do we need a similar kind of campaign? 
Yeah, uh, actually, there is a similar kind of campaign uh, which has been launched from 2019. And year on year, through the pandemic years, it's been going on. It's called the Jal Shakti Abhyan, which is Catch the Rain. Catch the rain. Uh, yeah. Where it falls, uh, when it falls. And that's a very important sort of message that's come across uh, mm. from the Prime Minister himself. Mm. Uh, and, and that is something that's key, right? That uh, this uh, resource that we have of rainwater, in our cities, uh, we just let it flow away. Uh, we do not... Uh, I mean, land in cities is so valuable. People want to, you know, build on every inch of land that they have. But the re resource that's falling on their own property, no, it's it's very difficult for people to go in and, uh, you know, get people to do rainwater harvesting, to do mm -hmm. other measures so that they are actually capturing the rainfall and using it as a resource. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I think this is something that then spills over not just at the citizen level but at institutional level as well, mm -hmm. um, because uh, again. Uh, and it's not just, I would say, institutional failure. It's also in the way that institutions are designed and put in place mm -hmm. that looking at rainwater, stormwater as a resource is not something that's been built in. It's coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, but as with so far as it had a trajectory before it reached this point where it was, you know, it was very common for people to understand or know about it. Uh, so we do need long term sustained campaigns like that. Uh, at the same time, I think people do need to get more aware and understand that uh, that we have a lot of siloed understanding of water. A lot of interventions happen in that very sort of, uh, you know, mm. bracketed manner that, uh, and, and particularly where people want to uh, intervene. I do understand there are challenges. It's difficult to take a whole overarching view, which is where you need government to come in and do some overarching planning. Mm. Uh, but then understanding that water is always a network. Uh, people mm. going in and improving one lake by itself mm. is difficult to sustain. Because what's happening in the catchment, what's happening in the watershed yeah. is always going to affect. Yeah. So those sort of learnings have to come across through media, through uh, government campaigns. It has to be much more widespread. Um, and it's it's an ecosystem that has to be built up to become more aware about this. Yeah. So in fact, two of our subscribers, Kamal and uh, Rupa Vedantam, you know, wrote detailed mail to us uh, giving their suggestions on what needs to be done, why, how rainwater harvesting should be made mandatory, what citizens can do, asking us that to ask you basically what citizens can do and you, as you've very in detail answered this. But actually rainwater harvesting, it, there is a provision for it, but we, we see in cities, I know or in Delhi, we don't see m much happening on it, you know, so I think we need to get a bit more serious about, uh, you know, recharging our groundwater through rainwater harvesting, we should do that. Uh, shifting, uh, basically, I want to also now talk about a little about uh, how cities, you know, we have seen in Delhi right now, we are facing an acute water shortage. And but there is this tussle between state governments over water, right? In Delhi, we, you know, as, as we speak, our Delhi water minister Atishri is on a indefinite protest, you know, uh, Delhi government is blaming the Haryana government for not releasing adequate water, Haryana government is blaming uh, the Delhi government for mismanagement. This in this tussle, it is the citizens who are suffering, right? So, how do you see Anshuman? Uh, how do you? What is the solution to this particular problem? And it is not a new thing. We have seen it in the past. States have fought, have disputes over water. How do you see? What is the way forward for this particular problem? Sure. And it's very unfortunate to see that, you know, it's not the first time that we are debating on this and come every summer, this the, yeah. the topic of water gets into debates and discussion. Hmm. Uh, it surprises me to just look at the scenario that, uh, you know, um, agencies who have been in charge of managing water and especially uh, knowing the fact that water is a transboundary resource across the, it's, it doesn't look at the, you know, political boundary. Hmm. Why we have not been able to have some very known age old practices of, you know, let's say river basin management approach. I mean, something that I fail to understand, we have had these, uh, you know, discussed number of times. And I, I think across the world, this is something very tried and tested method of having a river basin management approach where different stage states or let's say the upper riparian, the lower riparian kind of bodies states can have a look at what is available to them, can look into the kind of availability scenario, demand and supply scenario. Mm -hmm. And based on that plan for themselves, you know, for uh, let's say in a phase twice period, periodic manner. Unfortunately, we have not looked upon at that. We are not even measuring it properly. We are not, you know, assessing ourselves in a in a manner where we can scientifically first know what is the real situation, and then based on that, have a short-term and long-term strategy for 
which includes, for example, firstly, assessing what is available to us, given the climate change scenario, how is the availability being affected, what's our scenario telling us, how much is water going to be available today, how much water is going to be available, let's say, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now, and therefore, what are the interventions that we need to look into for augmenting uh, efficiency, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, which are all very established kind of, you know, uh, procedures for river basin management uh, of water resources or river water bodies. Now, we have not done that really methodically, uh, if I may say so. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, when situations come at the kind of, you know, stage where we are looking at it today, the, the blame game starts. Uh, I mean, uh, to be honest, Haryana has its own reason. You know, uh, if you look into Delhi, Delhi has its own reasons. Maybe both of them might be correct. But have we looked upon as two, three, four, five, you know, states together that, well, this is a situation we have always faced in the past. Let's sit together in a kind of, like I said, integrated river basin management approach and figure out a solution. I think that's where we have missed on, out every single time. And uh, I mean, I can go on narrating what are the principles of any mm. river basin management, but just to mm. mention to you what is the way forward, I believe mm. this has to be the way forward. To look into this beyond our political interest, mm. uh, more as a natural boundary and respecting the upper and lower riparian demand and kind of usage of water, yeah. looking into the challenges simultaneously as to, like I said, you know, de growing demand, uh, impacts of climate change, pollution, et cetera, et cetera. How we are using it, I already mentioned we are very wasteful, not just for domestic sector. We mm -hmm. didn't talk about irrigation sector, by the way, which is more than 80% consumption. And the water use efficiency is very, very low, uh, anywhere around 38 40%. So mm -hmm. if we are able to look into improving our efficiency, uh, looking our based on av availability, uh, rational allocation of water, uh, mm -hmm. giving it right valuation for usage, and uh, look and building in all the kind of water conservation in interventions, including what you just mentioned about re uh, rainwater harvesting, but also recycle reuse into the perspective yeah. aspects which are you know uh, related to augmentation. I think all of that taken mm -hmm. together. We'll mm -hmm. have a much better situation, I would say, in future. And this is uh, any any person who is managing or who is studying water can tell you is the mm -hmm. very basic. And I think we, as as uh, you know, let's say the ULBs or the politician need to sit together to look at it more in a mm -hmm. humane way rather than a political way to figure out a solution for the common man. Okay, um, Sahana, just taking it forward from what Anshuman mentioned about reuse of water, uh, do you think cities are doing enough? to uh, reuse water? Uh, clearly not. Uh, that's, I think, one of the largest gaps that's there uh, in terms of uh, what water we have. And again, mm. it comes back to the thing about ownership or stewardship of water. Uh, mm. Once the city has water, the wastewater actually belongs to it. Mm. Uh, but for the most part, uh, primarily because uh, pollution control boards requires ULBs to treat it, uh, sewage treatment plants, etc., are put in and water is treated, but then all of it is let uh, let down downstream. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really surprising because this is a resource that's been treated uh, often to really high standards. Uh, maybe there might be a lot of uh, sort of cultural issues of using it for portable reasons uh, if it's treated to that scale, but there are a lot of non-portable uses that this could be used for. And the, the switch that would happen is that when you start using recycled water, you stop depending on fresh water for those uses. Uh, hmm. So the dependence of fresh water on uh, you know, degrading another resource is actually going to decrease. So uh, it's really uh, surprising that given the urgency, given the state we are in, that institutionally this is not becoming much more prevalent. Uh, and we would understand this institutional prevalence if we started seeing states bring up policies like this. But mm -hmm. there are very few states which have like a, a state level wastewater reuse policy. And so on. Gujarat is one of the first ones that has done it. Okay. Um, uh, Karnataka has one. But then having the policy is just step one. Implementing mm -hmm. it actually happens on ground is uh, all the next steps that have to follow. And it really is central that ULBs really take this up. The urban local body, the hmm. water supply board or the local authority mm -hmm. has to mm -hmm. take this up. Hmm. They're the ones who have the largest scale. Hmm. Uh, in Bangalore, for example, and I think a lot of other cities also, there are a lot of decentralized sewage treatment plants that are coming in because you have large apartments that are required to be hmm. completely self sufficient and uh, do zero liquid discharge and so hmm. on. But that scale is not enough to uh, actually address uh, what is happening across the city. Uh, so yes, everyone at decentralized levels may need to do it, but uh, centralized uh, sewage treatment plants and management of water has hmm. to build in this reuse practice. Uh, 
Um, okay. If I can get a minute, I can talk a little bit about something that Bangalore Bangalore is trying out. Please. Uh, it has uh, detractors as well. There are challenges within the system, but it's a new innovation that's being tried out. Mm -hmm. uh, so Bangalore is, uh, uh, is managed by BWSSB, that's Bangalore Water Supply Storage Board. Mm -hmm. uh, they have partnered with the Minor Irrigation Department in Karnataka, which is a state level body. Okay. And they are taking treated wastewater from Bangalore City uh, to districts uh, uh, close to Bangalore, which are very water stressed uh, and are actually using that water to do tank uh, refilling. So this is like irrigation tanks that are refilled. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, the, because the irrig irrigation tanks are filled in, the aquifer levels are improving mm -hmm. and uh, farmers over there can draw the water and uh, use it for irrigation. And they're starting to see actually some uh, improvement in livelihood conditions in uh, you know agricultural returns and yields and so on. Um, it's a it's a complex system. It has challenges within it because we need to ensure that the water quality that's released is always high quality. Untreated waste is not going in and so on. But it's a system that's being tried and tested. And the, these are ways that uh, if a city alone is not able to use all of its water, how do you still distribute and make good use of it? Mm -hmm. So these are elements that have to start coming in instead of just saying that we have treated it, we have met our due diligence as per Pollution Control Board, we will just let it flow downstream. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So yeah, that's a decent example that's come up. Okay. Uh, uh, I just want yeah, please, please. Yeah, I just quickly wanted to add on that. You know, there are two larger issues about it. One is that we are not really using the potential that we so-called wastewater. In fact, we have stopped calling in India as wastewater. We are calling it used water now. Mm -hmm. So we have to look this wastewater as a resource rather than as a waste. And mm -hmm. we have demonstrated in a very recent project called Pavitra Ganga. Uh, okay. uh, your viewers can go to the website and see the details about it. But the fact that the technologies are now available where you can not only treat the water to the desired reuse quality, but as well recover the resource from it, generate energy, which can basically reduce your energy consumption even of the treatment plant. So these are today's solutions. It's just that we need to bring the need, bring all these in into practice in a very uh, arranged manner, a planned mm -hmm. manner, and include the people into the entire narrative of the recycled reuse. You cannot do it alone as an entity. You have to build the trust of the users that these mm -hmm. are the kind of ways to reuse the water. And once that journey starts in a very you know, organized manner over a period of time, you will see the benefit. And the second thing that I wanted to mention was about the recycle reuse standards. You know, okay. there has been a bottleneck uh, about you know, how do you define these reuse standards itself. Uh, I think we have come out with a policy brief on that about mainstreaming wastewater recycle reuse and resource recovery in India. That's again available at the website, uh, Terry's website. But then just the point that, you know, the last mile connectivity issues need to be kind of addressed for the wastewater reuse to actually upscale to a larger percentage. Okay. So while um, the, we need policy interventions for wastewater use, one thing that some cities have started is uh, providing 24-7 water supply. So I would like to talk to you both and get your perspective on it. That uh, Just to give you an idea, that uh, just to talk about it, that Puri was the first city in India to, become, to start providing 24-7 water supply. In Odisha, uh, the government is uh, carrying out projects in 24 cities you know, to provide 24-7 water supply. So I want to know from you that how feasible is um, it to provide 24-7 round-the-clock water supply in cities? And is it a good idea? Can it be done? So, uh, Anshuman, you want to go yes, first? Sir. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. There are cities who are doing it, you know, since years now. I mean, when hmm. we travel across the, you know, countries in Europe, you can just open the tap and drink water. They don't even, you know... Um, ask you to have a, a bottle of water. Uh, hmm. I mean, this is something which is very much feasible. In fact, many of the cities of the size of Delhi, hmm. uh, you know, have lesser water availability to them, but they are able to supply 24-7 because they are able to take control of the reduction of non-revenue water, leakage losses control, efficiency improvement. So all of these are critical factor. Hmm. And like I said earlier, it is very much feasible, very much possible. On the contrary, this is more efficient way of, you know, managing water. The more you have leakage losses, the, the, the loss is actually on your revenue and the kind of surety of supply for the longer period of time is not there. And the more you, you, you know, have the pressurized pipe water without leakage losses in, in the system, you have enough water to be reaching to the last mile and therefore you are able to supply that water, which otherwise is lost into the system from as leakage losses. Okay. So in terms of feasibility, very much. 
on the hmm. contrary as well for example when you do not have a continuous water supply there are other technical issues the system actually gets over a period of time dilapidated for example a hammer effect which is very commonly known you know you keep on uh, switching on and switching off and there's a hammer effect on the you know infrastructure i mean this is just few example so it's in the in the you know interest hmm. to have actually 24/7 water uh, rather than have a you know reduced supply or in, in intermittent supply and of mm -hmm. course, uh, you know the consumer satisfaction is anyways not there. It's also a vicious cycle. You know, the more you build the co the confidence of the con consumer that the, when you will open the tap, the mm -hmm. water will be available to you. I think they will be ready to support any kind of you know to guarantee that when I will open my tap, I will have water of the quantum that I am required to. For example, one thirty five LPCD has has been uh, kind of put across by our uh, urban norms. Yeah. As well of the water quality for drinking purposes, for example, as per the BIS norm, which is mm. uh, IS10500. So mm. I think if we are able to ensure that the consumer are, I mean, if you look into the households around most of the cities, uh, you would have, uh, you know, filter at your home. I have filter at my home. Why do we need to invest into filters at our home? We are very much conscious that, you know, we need to have good quality water and therefore we would be ready to, you know, pay the cost for it. Yes, there are, you know, marginal society, you know, uh, kind of fact, yeah. section of society, which will require water to be given free of course, but there are ways to do that. Increased block tariff is one of those examples. Hmm. Okay, Sahana, would you like to ask? We can... Okay, sorry, I'm not able to, hello. Right, the water, some of the water is free of course, water, you know, hmm. for some basic, very much in interest of, you know, efficient service delivery to have 24-7 water supply. Okay. Yeah, uh, Anshu has actually given quite a lot of detail. Uh, I think just one other piece that I would add on to that uh, hmm. is not from the infrastructure piece, but from a social, uh, social, uh, and development developmental perspective. Mm -hmm. Having twenty four seven water actually helps then reduce the burden of water collection, water storage on households. Uh, okay. So whether it's uh, middle income or low income households typically these are because these are considered household work the sense mm -hmm. of being the uh, burden on women and children mm -hmm. uh, and that's time that's taken away from being employed or being able mm -hmm. to study because mm -hmm. they're doing this sort of work of you know uh, this is a key household uh, resource that you're putting across so mm -hmm. having 24 7 water actually is a very important uh, piece in making this switch as well mm -hmm. um i would only say that one caution is uh, required uh is that a lot uh, and my sense is that a lot of cities are actually taking and building that infrastructure of delivering the water, uh, but they also at the same time need to ensure that the water source that they're reliant on uh, is going to endure. Uh, because that's the biggest challenge that we are going to see with climate change, that that uh, 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 surety that our water resource is going to be available uh, throughout the year for us to uh, continuously provide the 24-7. Uh, we need to just uh, build uh, build the water portfolio a little uh, larger in a more diverse way over there. Uh, mm -hmm. Typically, cities are starting to depend on, say, single sources. I mean, uh, Haryana, uh, uh, Delhi, I think, mm -hmm. uh, because you're dependent on a single river source. Mm -hmm. Uh, or on Kave, uh, dependent on uh, but we need to build out more of our local resources uh, not that that will take up all of the load of our water demand but it's a uh, additional piece that is there and if there are water stress periods you are then able to tap into say the uh, reuse recycled water or the groundwater that you have saved and stored so far so I, I would say in the 24 7 piece uh, it's very important it is absolutely uh, necessary that cities should move towards it hmm. it's definitely a marker of moving from a developing country to a developed country uh, but um, but also at the same time to ensure that the source waters that we are looking at are actually protected and preserved uh, i just cities? wanted to add yeah. to that i think that's yeah, a very yeah. important point that sohana mentioned see uh, there are two two things which are very important to understand when we are looking into urban planning uh, a uh, terminology that we use is carrying capacity. We need to assess the carrying capacity of any reason for, you know, before development. Water is one part of that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have never looked into, I have never come across any planning which is basically done uh, based on the resource availability, uh, which is also called carrying capacity. Gurgaon is, a, you know, the water table has gone down so much that you know i have known people who have left gurgaon just because they have faced water as a crisis for them and individually so mm -hmm. we need to look into that uh you know as as a planner
but then mm. also as a fact from the perspective of management i think we need to india is fortunately still blessed with good amount of water we are still not riyadh or israel or you know countries who just do not have water mm. uh, and therefore it's very important that our mm. our focus starts from water demand management rather than water supply management yes you will need supply and sub- situationally that will be the case but by and large the key lies in how we are focusing on water demand management how much you are we are investing okay. into water demand management will hmm. lie the success story of our you know uh, water management in okay. future so while we talk about this um cities which are implementing 24/7 water supply they are upgrading their infrastructure you know they're using technology to ensure there are no leakages now this comes as a comes at a cost you know so and uh, the what we you mentioned a uh, little late uh, earlier was about pricing so i want to ask you that uh, like electricity you know we take all measures uh, to save electricity so do you think uh, we need to now relook at how about pricing our water you know that we need to put a price to water that people should pay for it uh you want me to start or yeah anyway and in this i will just mention one of our subscriber <laughs> you know uh sobik datta also has uh, raised this issue and he also mentioned that you know should be impose a uh, tax on usage of water so if you can just tell us that how should be priced it uh, should what should be the price how should cities go see, about it see see as far as uh, water pricing is concerned and i would want to use mm-hmm. the term valuing water resource is concerned we mm-hmm. are already decades late i mean mm-hmm. we had to you know start this way long back mm-hmm. water is not coming free of cost and you know for those who want to argue that water resource is you know natural resource coming from the sky free of cost as rainfall mm-hmm. by all means if you want to go to a you know river and fetch your water by your means it is very much free of cost for you mm-hmm. if you want to treat it for potability with your own efforts it has to be free of cost to you but if you are hmm. not going to do that if you are wanting water sitting in your home at the tap of the quality that is you know safe enough to drink then there is and therefore it has to be kind of you know respected and therefore it has to be kind of built into the supply system hmm. uh, over the you know uh, kind of you know years we have not seen you know water pricing i think as i said the marginal society can be provided free of cost in a water of a certain amount which is essential hmm. but then after that through inc- increased volumetric tariff you know we can go into that mechanism to have additional water tariff come across but it cannot come you know at a drop of a hat uh, the thing is it has to be induced like you know if you look into the case of electricity or petrol you know the now petrol is at a market price but it was with subsidized earlier and we slowly lifted off the you know subsidies over a period of time i think the same has to be done in in the case of ulps as well we have to have a 10 year 15 year kind of uh, outline wherein we st- start you know releasing our subsidies or reducing our subsidies and gradually simultaneously as well i think sohana mentioned it a very important point we have to build the con- awareness of the consumer that this is a resource which is not free of cost unfortunately and hmm. you need to respect it make them understand this is the scarcity value the kind of challenges that is faced for our water supply and mm-hmm. simultaneously bring in the cost factor and i think over a period of time it is induced people will do realize everybody realizes you know mm-hmm. and then they are ready to kind of you know come on board for a rationalized price you know water supply system so mm-hmm. we need to take that as a management approach and in long term mm-hmm. uh, and i think that's the kind of way forward in any case otherwise we are going to just keep seeing the wastages and keep talking about you know crisis every single summer as we are doing it right now sana you want to add to this uh yeah just one other point uh, and i think kanjuman's way a better place to speak on the pricing piece but uh, there's another uh, piece around this whole valuing of water hmm. uh, one of the key challenges is that we don't really look at a social cost of water or a true cost right uh, we uh, i mean even water supply uh, boards and uh, you know authorities who are providing the water may uh, do the calculation based on how much they spend on say pump pumping the water or the pumping structure they have put in and so on uh, mm-hmm. and that is a price for sure but mm-hmm. there are more tens of what 
is the environmental cost of it, what are the climate costs of it. Uh, so, for example, Bangalore is pumping water a hundred kilometers away of pumping and there's a hmm. huge amount of climate emissions that is uh, the approach for, for the authority is that and, and because it's in the mandate the mandate is they have to supply whatever pipelines they pipeline from the same resource environmental impact build that in then then you bring in the question of does it does it make more sense economically and from a social cost perspective to hmm. look at local water okay to look at recycled benefit analysis using true cost or social hmm. cost then hmm. you can do that comparison Right now, if you ask any utility, they will say that if we treat a wastewater and put in all these recycle systems, it's going to be very expensive. Of course, it's going to be expensive because right now they're not doing a true cost of whatever fresh water they are bringing in, right? This, this, uh, this thinking of what you have to count to account for the high level, it's a bit of a research thinking, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I think you know, even at a consumer level, we do this for a lot of other things. We do factor in, it's not just a price point, right? It's a price point in comparison to say, if it has health benefits for us and so on. So uh, even from a utility or a water supply institution perspective, they really need to start thinking of uh, these other sort of costs that are built in and mm -hmm. then take decisions on which is the better source to look at. And uh, which is a better management, uh, additional to the pricing piece, of course. Uh, sort of came again was, we actually, Suhana did a study wherein mm. we compared the options available for a city. I'm not going to take name of the city, but, mm. you know, we gave them an option for a new pipeline for a water source versus a recycled, reuse and water conservation sort of package, mm. uh, which was way half less you know, in, in terms of investment, hmm. and they could still meet the demand supply gap. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I totally agree on that. We need to evaluate that in terms of what is the best. I think that's the way to look forward holistically. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we have an interesting question from two of our subscribers. Basically, uh, Rajesh Davila, uh, Davial. Um, he wants to know that is desalination at large scale viable, uh, especially in coastal cities. And another subscriber, P. Krishnan, said that in US, uh, some cities are actually doing it. And uh, he, in fact, has a suggestion to make that there is a he says that there is a need for intensive research to make desalination more economical by linking it to solar power. So I want to have I want to know your quick thoughts on it. Is it possible? In India? Uh, so, uh, yes, it is very, very much possible. I think what needs to be looked into account as far as desalination is concerned, it's hmm. kind of usage at the location that we are talking about. So it's quite viable and feasible in many cases for the coastal regions. Chennai is a very good example of that. Chennai is, you know, using this, they have killed it as well. I mm -hmm. think to 400 MDD or something. Yeah. Um, but to say that desalination could be a, you know, kind of options to supply water across the country, I, I don't think so. First, it is a very energy intensive exercise. Uh, it, it is very, very difficult to see that you know, to you know, supply uh, water through this started you know as an option towards it but i think again there's a scale challenge and uh, efficiency challenge which is still being kind of researched and tried and tested in, as far as technology is concerned uh it has improved quite significantly from it from where it was like two decades back uh, you know i think from somewhere around uh, 80 or 50 kind of you know dollar per meter cube of you know this cost it mm -hmm. has now come significantly low to around i think 20 30 you know usd per meter cube so we are much better off in terms of the cost. Uh, the technology itself is improving over a period of time, but I think uh, it, it will not be safe to say that you know we, we can look for uh, desalination as uh, a desolution for the entire supply system. But yes, its applicable application is quite useful at the locations where you just don't have any option. Mm -hmm. And to, for example, in the coastal region where you do not have you, you do not have too much of you know uh, kind of investment to make into supply pipelines. Okay. 
Sana, you want to add? To yeah, that? a few things have... on that. Uh, mm. I think uh, I will echo what uh, Anshuman is saying on this also. I, I think that's a big danger in sort of of picking a one technology and saying this is the solution for everything uh, mm. with water what we're increasingly realizing is that it's better to have a diverse portfolio uh, okay. yes you might have one with a critical source which is typically going to be river sources uh, surface river uh, or reservoirs uh, near the city mm. uh, for sure because the cities are at such a scale that just local groundwater rainwater recharge is not going to meet it uh, but at the same time if you uh, like just sort of depending on one source of water is very problematic because we know with uh, different risks coming from climate change, from the fact that the energy scenario in our country is still a bit variable, uh, depending on something that requires energy is on coastal lands really, uh, is therefore vulnerable to coastal risks. Uh, mm -hmm. is a problem because if you ever face, you know, uh, uh, if there are uh, issues around, say, cyclones, etc., which shuts down a diesel plant, then your dependency has uh, now cut off your water supply as well, mm -hmm. which is why uh, looking at a diverse portfolio is better. Um, I mean, it, it's a very financial sort of term, but then having a diverse portfolio, even from a, you know, like from an investment perspective is that's why it's talked of, right? So even mm -hmm. for water, that's what is to be looked at. Primarily, uh, also to understand that these different uh, 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 types of water sources or resources that we uh, depend on are mm. not uh, being affected by the same climate risk. Uh, mm. So, for example, uh, you know, uh, a lot of cities choose to do, uh, you know, as I said, uh, look at reservoirs, uh, surface water reservoirs uh, on rivers, so dams and uh, collect water from that. And if they see that one dam, particular dam is, you know, reducing in water volumes there for whatever other reasons, upstream and so on, they mm. might choose to do this on another river basin. Uh, mm -hmm. But most of India, all of peninsular India, really, the risk factor is the same, right? Uh, across our mon monsoons and all the, uh, it's not like uh, a certain area within peninsular India or a certain area into adjacent states is going to have a very drastically different rainfall volume. Uh, so then just shifting uh, your dependency from one river to another is not really going to change your climate risk profile. Uh, so again, it comes back to this, that these are the sort of decision uh, making criteria that needs to be built in. Uh, into our uh, utility managers, water utility managers, and also into our uh, general public's understanding of how water is coming and water is being sourced. Uh, the uh, We really need to break away from that whole attitude that if I open my tap, there's water and not have any connection with where that actually, the where that water is coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, and what are the conditions in the watershed which can affect, uh, you know, uh, my water supply. So that awareness building is also required uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, looking at, uh, broad types of uh, water resources hmm. uh, to actually meet water needs. Okay, done. Thank you so much, Anshuman, Sahana. Thanks a lot for sharing uh, your inputs, your insight into the whole water crisis. I hope our subscribers also uh, had, uh, in, uh, I mean, would uh, had an interest. I mean, and could understand what the issue is, what are the issue, what problems are there, and how we can fix these problems. Thank you both for joining us today. And I would also like to thank all our subscribers for uh, participating in this discussion. It is only because of you all that we are able to hold such events. So please ask your family and friends to subscribe and so that we can continue to have these discussions and uh, see you soon next month for the discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, bye.